This is David Coro again, and thank you for joining me again for Real Life Worth Living as we one more time look into the Word of God and we discover the elements of faith that He has for us in order to make our lives worth living, make our lives more productive as men and women who are uh, submitted and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ in order to make our lives count for Him. You know, you might be a very important person in your community, in your state, in your country, in your church, in your home, your place of business, whatever. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you uh, do know Him, but you are not growing in Christ, you are not taking the things of the Word of God and making them personal in your own lives in order uh, to produce a, a more productive and, yes, a holy life before God, then you've missed the mark. And so that's why we are making these broadcasts, and that's why we teach and preach, and that's why we write, uh, in order to get God's Word across to as many as possible. Not only so we can hear, well done, thou faithful servant, but that so you will hear it as well as you commit yourself to the things of the Spirit of God, to the Word of God. Now we're picking up again in Hebrews chapter 11. And remember, we call this the faith chapter because it deals with the faith that we have commonly in the Lord Jesus Christ by having trusted Him as our Savior, as our Lord, our Master. And so... Uh, then we have put ourselves in the place of responsibility of living up to that relationship with Jesus Christ in paying attention to Him, drawing close to Him, learning His Word, uh, learning to fellowship with one another, learning to pray with and for one another, about one another, and uh, to draw together in a body of believers that honors Christ. And that's what our whole, entire uh, existence in this world, apart from uh, beyond the part of our salvation, is all about. Now, we call this the faith chapter. And the patriarchs that we are looking at now are tremendous examples of faith. That's why God preserved them and their stories here in this chapter, or made note of them here in this chapter. The stories themselves come earlier, uh, and it uh, is a good thing for us to look back at those too. In fact, we're going to have to, because my text is in, in uh, verse 20 in Hebrews chapter 11, which is a very short verse, and it's quite a jump from where we were last time. Last time we saw Abraham uh, being called out to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice for sin. At which time, because of his willingness to obey God, because of his follow-through, because he and Isaac went to the place where uh, the sacrifice should be made, and because he followed through with all of the elements of sacrifice firmly believing that God would provide him an animal sacrifice in the place of his son, but if he didn't, that God would raise him again from the dead. And so we, the last time we saw Isaac, he was a beautiful picture of the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as Abraham received him back uh, from the altar of sacrifice, his living son, in order that... Uh, uh, he could go on and live out the rest of his life then and be a continued example of faith for us. And yet, none of these people is perfect. Not a one of them has anything other than feet of clay, just like you and I. They have, they have plenty of faults. They have plenty of failures. Uh, there are times when they are not reliable. There were times when they lied. There were times when they failed God. There were times when they failed one another. 
there were times when they didn't pass every specific test that, that God gave them to pass in order to grow their faith. They fell back too. They shrank away from faith too. And yet, through God's prolonged dealing with them, through his continual opportunities, by giving them various trials and tests, then they were able to make up for their failures with greater successes. And that's the same way we operate today. Whenever we fail, whenever we fall, whenever we back away from something that God wants us to do, uh, whenever we shrink away from what we know to be the will of God in our life, then when God brings that to our attention, and he will, uh, in no unmistakable, uh, no, uh, uh, no way that you can possibly miss it, God will, will poke your conscience with his spirit in order for you to, to know what kind of a failure that you have committed. And then, in recognizing that, if you will confess it as sin, because it surely is, and will receive his forgiveness, which you receive upon confession, and strive to do that much better, drawing closer to him in fellowship, drawing closer to him in partnership, drawing closer to him by uh, getting into the word of God and understanding where you fell and what God wants you to do and what you need to do from this point. How to grow. How to uh, make the wrongs right. How to fix the things that are broken. All of these are, are elements that you and I need to know, but they only come from our constant fellowship in and with the Spirit of God, the constant fellowship with the Father, constantly looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, our faith life. He is the one who makes our faith worth living, our life worth living. He's the one who makes it real life. And real life is what he called us to. And it can only be attained then as we devour the Word of God, and we make it ours, and we uh, we replace the the human thinking, the so-called human wisdom, with the wisdom of God, with the knowledge of God, with the knowledge of the Word of God, and then at that point, we begin to have the understanding that God wants us to have. We begin to think through the mind of God. We think His thoughts after him, and that produces righteousness in our life, and that produces a character which is like unto that of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we become then obvious imitations of the person of Christ. We're not Christ. We're not God. But we become godly. We become Christ-like, and we are obviously then the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are obviously followers of the Word of God. And so uh, I want to get into our text and from there go back to the book of Genesis. Now in order to get from Hebrews 11.19 to Hebrews 11.20, we've got to look at about four chapters in the book of Genesis in order to fill in the blanks, and it behooves us to fill in those blanks so that we know exactly what went into uh, the lives of these people between the steps that are marked out for us as extreme examples of faith to be copied, to be emulated. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. As I said before, the last time we saw Isaac in our study, he was probably in his mid-teens and he had exchanged places with a ram. For God had provided a lamb in order to take the place of Isaac uh, so that Abraham would have the proper sacrifice to offer 
and Isaac then would be alive to be able to carry on and to carry out his calling as a patriarch in society, as a minister of God, as a righteous soul on the earth, as an example of faith not only to his own generations but to all of us who look to his example as we read about it in the Word of God as we study it and as we take those elements to heart. Pushing away the things that he did wrong and adopting the things that he got right. And God there very clearly points those out to us so that we can delineate which, which is which and what they are and uh, help us in our understanding Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, as you can see, that's not a very lengthy passage, and it doesn't fill in a whole lot uh, of Isaac's life between his teenage years and the years here where he is blessing Jacob and Esau and sending them on their ways in order for them to start their own families and uh, to become patriarchs in their own right, and certainly they are. Abraham and Sarah at this point have advanced quite a bit in age. Not only did Isaac get older, he's become a, a middle-aged man or older, and so Abraham and Sarah have also advanced in age, and back over here in the book of Genesis in chapter 23, uh, we come to the end of the life of Sarah, the wife of Abraham, the one that God blessed by giving her a son of her own, she who was barren from the beginning, and God gave her the fruit of her womb, which was Isaac, whom she named Isaac, laughter, because God told her to. In verses 1 through 6, and we discover here that Sarah is approximately now 127 years of age. And since we know there is about 10 years worth of difference between Abraham and Sarah, he is approximately 137 years of age. And Sarah was in 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirja Arba, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession, a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Now you see the tremendous respect that Abraham had earned among his neighbors, among his countrymen, and they had so much respect for him that they offered him one of their sepulchers. They said they would withhold nothing uh, for a burial place for Sarah.